a uh, very warm welcome to one and all again so at the outset i take this opportunity to thank dr prabhakar and wallo university kumbhaja institute of technology for having given me the opportunity to give a small talk on the emerging trends in the automobile industry uh, two key topics mainly industry 4.0 and uh, hybrid electric uh, vehicles so i am an engineer at srn nikki auto systems india it's a joint venture company between srm technologies who are into a lot of uh, embedded technologies for uh, the automotive side as well as electronics and uh, it industry wherein they use a lot of artificial intelligence machine learning and internet of things and they leverage these technologies to give the uh, satisfy the demands of the customer and the other company is nikki carburetors limited which is a huge japanese company uh, in intended to uh, carburetors and fuel injection systems and they also make a wide range of electronic control units for fuel injection cars and bikes and we also do a lot of electric vehicle motors and motor controllers that is a small outlook of our, our company let's go into the webinar so this would be the agenda for the next hour first we will talk about the various disruptions the automotive industry is facing in this decade next we will move on to the emerging trends which will consist of industry 4.0 and of course hybrid vehicles then moving on to the hybrid vehicles we will go on to the range of vehicles which you could hybridize or electrify and we move on to a small research project of mine which is a hybrid two wheeler and we go towards the powertrain the estimated range the usage and how we can use the same technology for different applications and finally we can have a small question and answer session okay let's move on to the first thing automotive industry disruptions so if this acronym is widely thrown around in the automotive space what is case case stands for connected autonomous shared and electric so what is connected you you might have heard about connected cars wherein your car is connected to the internet and suppose you want to go out for a cup of coffee you say car please take me to the coffee station so since it is a smart car it will it is connected to the internet and it will automatically take you to your favorite coffee station it will show you how long you have to travel whether you will have parking space when you reach how long you you might spend which is the best venue and then it can also plot a course for you back home and since it is a smart car it will most likely be an electric vehicle so it will also calculate the estimated distance and whether your battery capacity is enough to reach that distance and then reach home as well and suppose there is a charging station next to the coffee shop it can also book a charging spot if the charge in your vehicle will not be enough for your journey afterwards so this is the era of the connected smart car next we move on to the autonomous vehicle so the autonomous vehicle is like basically a taxi service or which you can hail whenever you want to go suppose you want to go to the shops or if even if you want to go to office your daily commute to office or college you can book a vehicle it will automatically come to your place and take you to the office while during your commute you can have various meetings or if you are a student you can finish your assignments you can even surf the web get your assignments done and all this is done without a driver so how does the car drive you might ask the car has a wide array of lidar and radar and cameras to see the obstacles in front of the car and navigate to the obstacles there are also various levels of autonomy like for example the car which car you might drive might have something called cruise control so cruise control is something wherein you set a specific speed and the car will travel at that particular speed 
and you don't have to do anything apart from intervene when there is an obstacle. You might just have to press the brake and take control of the steering. So autonomous cars can even do the braking for you. They can take care of the steering and as well as the accelerator. So suppose there is an accident in front of the car. The car can sense it and avoid that accident. And finally, the third one, you have shared mobility. But then due to the pandemic, shared mobility has taken a step back, wherein you have various ride sharing services, wherein you share your journey with another person. It can be an electric car or it can be an autonomous car. So the key fact is that you don't own the car. You don't have to worry about the fuel, the maintenance, the insurance, the upfront cost of buying the car, the parking space, all that. The car is owned by a third party. You use it whenever you want. This is what is called now as mobility as a service. Finally, we come to the fourth disruption, which is an electric car. And you might have, this might be very familiar to you, the Tesla. The Tesla uh, cars, the Model X, the Model Y, the Model S, and the Model E. So Tesla are one of the pioneers in the EV industry, electric vehicle industry. And they also have various uh, levels of autonomy which can be reached. They have this patented battery cell which enables them to give the maximum performance and the maximum range which is very close to what a conventional petrol or diesel car gives you and it is also near zero emission i will not say it is completely without emission it will not harm the environment at all because mining for the batteries and the various materials that go into the batteries are harmful. Plus, the electricity that you put into the car, the source from where you produce that electricity is very important. If you can produce that electricity from, say, wind power or tidal power, it's useful. Because if you produce the electricity by burning coal, it defeats the purpose of having an electric car. You can might as well drive a petrol or a diesel car. So these are the four key disruptions or key, key four research areas where people can do their masters and their research work on. So moving on to the emerging trends and the talk of the hour, Industry 4.0. So what exactly is Industry 4.0? Well, you have the four industrial revolutions, the initial one being mechanization and steam power, moving on to a production line, and then finally coming to automated production systems. And we are moving on to the fourth revolution, which is Industry 4.0. You might be sitting in uh, Kumbolcha and you'll be controlling a factory in Durban or even in America. So that that's the level of autonomy that your factory will have. All this is possible only through Internet of Things, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Unless your process is capable, your process is correct and accurate, you cannot with utmost confidence go into Industry 4.0 and expect your product, your final product, to be as per the specification of the customer. So let's go into what exactly is Industry 4.0 and why did we come and how did we come to Industry 4.0. So initially you had horse-drawn carts that was replaced by steam engines through various sorts of mechanization. You had water, steam power, hydro power, and you had different manufacturing methods Iron was starting to be produced from the mines and various tier 3 companies. Your textile industry was booming. The spinning mill was introduced. Mining and metallurgy took really the driver's seat. And you also had machine tools and all the factories run by steam. 
Now, we move on to the second revolution, wherein you had a lot of electrification, a lot of electrical things came into the picture to help the workers in uh, achieving their targets and improving their targets and accuracy of the products. Uh, Henry Ford established the production line and the assembly line system for automobiles. Products were being produced in mass production levels. Globalization occurred. You had various internal combustion engines and gas turbines. And there was broad adoption of telegraph, which means communication was very easy. And, and then finally, you had gas and water supply. Now we move on to our decade wherein it is industry three. You have the internet, you have the computer, everything controlled using the computer and the internet. You have digital manufacturing, wherein you have CNC machines, which run on a set of preset codes, and the operator just has to check whether the operation has been done correctly, and as always, input the codes, and check for any errors in the codes. And you have a lot of PLC and robotics which come into place. You have digitization, automation, which means the tasks are done automatically, albeit with limited human interaction. You have various electronic and digital networks to monitor things. And you finally have digital machines. Now, one key thing about this, one key element which is missing, which, which was really, you know, thrown to light because of the pandemic we have. When the pandemic came into place, everything, everybody, all factories were on lockdown. You could not do anything. You could not step out of your house. You couldn't go to work. Nothing was being produced. Commerce wasn't happening. No cars were being built. No factories were being run. So what happened to the economy? The economy came to a standstill. But then, if you had automated machines, if you had advanced robotics, like you have in Industry 4, 4.0, you could have might as well run the factories because there was no humans in the factories. You could happily work from home and start your factory, say, 100, 200 kilometers away through the internet. Also, with this level of advanced robotics machinery, you can monitor each and everything. For example, if you take the automobile production line, you have to weld two panels together, say your front door to the chassis of the car, to the frame of the car. So how do you tell your machine that you have to keep the machine in this sort of an angle and weld it in a particular direction and you must have four welds on the car. So all this can be achieved through sensors. So first the machine should know what it is. It should know what position it is in. It should know what to weld and where to weld and how to weld it. Also, there should be another machine or the same machine monitoring the progress of this machine. So suppose you have four doors, you have two machines each, or you can have four doors, four machines for each door, or sorry, four machines for four doors, and one machine monitoring the progress. So you can monitor the results from this and also analyze the accuracy and quality of this. Plus, since we have a lot of machines, we'll be gathering a lot of data. So all the data can be analyzed and you can get potential risks which you might get from the machines or you can also improve the process. So again, all this is possible only through artificial intelligence, machine learning and Internet of Things. So your machines should be like a smartphone, like the smartphone you have, which monitors a lot of uh, parameters which has a lot of sensors and which tells you immediately suppose you want to uh, you want to know what the spelling of uh, India is you just say hey Google tell me the spelling of India it tells you so how did how did the, how did the smartphone know it's connected to the internet and it's connected to Google Google is a search engine you will get thousands of 
thousands of results of data on Google. So your phone should know what you're asking for, what result it has to search in, and also it has to relay that result to the customer. This is the simple, simplest introduction or simplest explanation you could give for uh, IoT and AI. Basically, Industry 4.0 focuses on the entire process. That is from scratch. You want a car, you design a car, you see how can you manufacture the car. Finally, how do you deliver the car to the end customer? This is your process, three-step process, design, manufacture, deliver. Now you have to see how you can automate this process. Through Industry 4.0, you can automate the process. You can simulate. We will see in the next slide. So, using, if you could see the bottom left-hand corner, simulate, you can simulate your design. You can simulate the design of the body. You can do analysis of it using various computer-aided design CAD softwares. You can analyze the wind flow over the car. You can analyze the heat. You can analyze the crash using finite element analysis all this can be done while from the comfort of your own home so all the data can be processed and you could the computer can tell you which design would be the most favorable to meet all your regulations and how is this possible you must have a physical mock-up at the factory and your system should also scan the mock-up of the car at the factory and then your laptop or your computer should coexist with the scanner at the factory. So your systems should integrate. There should be seamless integration. Plus, all your data has to be stored in one particular place at, say, a data center. So how is this possible? This is possible through cloud computing. So whatever you do on your laptop is visible on your mobile phone. Is visible on your manufacturing machine is visible on your scanner at the factory again how is this possible through Internet of Things but there is one risk suppose your laptop is stolen God forbid somebody steals your laptop what do you do so unless they have your fingerprint or your you know physical key password they cannot steal your information which is why cyber security plays a huge role in industry 4.0 you must have heard about say blockchain technology which is very important for uh, cyber security it is most essential in these times coming back to the design phase suppose you want to create a brand new product which nobody is uh, designed before you without going to say uh, an expensive factory in especially in these times you want to visualize the product how can you visualize the product you can use something called augmented reality and virtual reality uh, I hope all of you play video games so uh, they might have you might have ha kept a controller over your head the like the uh, Google Cardboard or Oculus Rift controller and you could see you can play the games in virtual reality most automakers also launch their cars online nowadays through OTT platforms and you can also visualize the car using augmented reality uh, when you have time I would like you to check out say Tata Motors Safari in Twitter they have launched an AR platform, augmented reality platform, wherein using your mobile phone, you can see the whole car. You can see the cars outside, you can see the cars inside, the engine, you can open the door, you can open the bonnet, you can see a very nice mock-up model of the car without going to a showroom from the comfort and safety of your own home. So again, all this is possible through data. Everything, since everything is electronic and everything is monitored, you have data. 
So you can use the data. How can you use the data? You can analyze, see how many people attended your lecture, how many people attended your uh, online unveiling of the car, how many people have booked a car using your online unveil, how many people have finally gotten delivery of their car through online. All these sorts of data analytics you can perform with big data. So you can also check in your factories in manufacturing for autonomous robots wherein it will be a difficult and uh, not difficult per se, it would be unsafe for a human being to go and you know perform certain actions of a car. See, painting a car is a very very dangerous process. You need the proper personal protective equipment, you need a rebreather, you need oxygen, you need eye protection, uh, you have to protect your hair, you have to have wear gloves to prevent splashes because it, everything is carcinogenous nowadays. So in these painting sort of scenarios, just like the painting sort of scenarios, you will have a lot of places where a human being cannot be you know, endangered. Life, human life is very important. So which is why you have autonomous robots. You program a robot to paint a car in this fashion. It will pro it'll do what it's told. It will paint the car in with the utmost quality and accuracy. Additive manufacturing is another another thing. Uh, you have you might have heard about uh, 3D printing, wherein you use a printer, a normal printer, with a special jet and special plastic plastic uh, material, which makes a small model of anything which you program into just a CAD model from the bottom to top. So what can you use this for? You can use it for parts which are very difficult to manufacture using various other sources. You can use it for parts for vehicles which don't which aren't produced anymore or even small parts for say mobile phones. You can 3D print a whole mobile phone using a 3D printer apart from certain things like a battery and a and uh, as the screen. So these are the various things which help out various components of Industry 4.0. Okay, now how do you implement it? You have sensors and actuators from the bottom of the pyramid. We'll start. You have sensors and actuators which bridge the digital and physical connection. Suppose you have, say, a speedometer in a vehicle. It can be an analog speedometer. Depending upon the spring tension, it will show you the speed of the vehicle. That is, however, not recorded. Suppose you want to know, okay, how fast did I go or how slow did I go? You cannot know. You, you will not know because it's not being recorded. In the same way, if you have a digital speed sensor, you will know how fast you went because it will record. Why will it record? Because it will use that speed sensor data for some other purpose, like say cruise control or emergency braking. So since you have a sensor sensing all the data which is being gathered, you can use that data to analyze and also make something useful out of that data say for improving your ABS system or improving the ride and handling of your vehicle. Moving further, we have systems and internal services. You might have say an auditing platform or what do you call it? You have a system check, a diagnostic check which happens throughout the day. You can automate it or you can see when the issues come up and do run it by a case by case basis and finally decide when you have to diagnose run an automatic diagnostic on the system so that can be automated finally you must have connectivity between all your systems so unless each system talks to one another you will not the one system will not know what the other is doing suppose your car is your same production line your car is in the front of the production line where all the components are being manufactured. They are being cast in the casting machine in a blast furnace. 
and then they are moving on to the machining side wherein certain parts have to be cut say in the riser has to be cut finally it moves to machining where the finished process the finished product is sent to paint and then to dispatch suppose some issue happens in paint the paint line stops so you can't have casting machining and the furnace casting and machining keep on running because it cannot go to paint there will be a blockade so when one system is shut down completely the other system should know that after that particular cycle is over they have to switch off until and unless the system is clear and you have a green signal to go ahead so this is why connectivity plays a major role finally you want to add a new line to your company a new system so the same new service and the new system has to coexist with the other ones and also come into this sort of industry 4.0 scenario now what are the benefits of industry 4.0 we've been talking a lot about what what industry 4.0 is how do you implement it what are the components what will be the benefit now productivity flexibility quality and speed you will have increased productivity through higher level of automation a majority of the projects you see at the company the improvement projects will be reduction of cycle time why is cycle time so important the lesser the cycle time is the more products you can produce in a day or in a given shift so using industry 4.0 you can might as well reduce the cycle time and improve your productivity but you should be very careful reduction of cycle time does not mean compromising on quality or accuracy you must have an accurate and perfect quality or perfect you could say uh, as to specification level quality product while reducing cycle time so all this it is not only in the process in in the production line you know you have to transport your material from a shed to the production line and then it is inspected and then it is sent into the first first stage of the production line so industry 4.0 covers the entire cycle not only the production line it covers the place where it is raw material is stored the place where it is inspected inspected and it comes to the production line and finally dispatched to the customer so this is how you can improve your productivity next would be improving your flexibility okay suppose you are a gear manufacturer you make gears for gear boxes for cars where else are gears found gears are found in differentials gears are found in uh, reduction gear boxes gears are found everywhere so suppose you want to make a huge gear for a ship you want to install a new production line a uh, line or line b to your line a through industry 4.0 and robots and machines which can execute the production uh, process for a wide range of products and processes you can you will be you will, you you can achieve high flexibility in the process and as i said previously your reduction in cycle time should not affect your quality so quality can be improved because you are checking every stage of the process just because uh, not, not not just because you can you are supposed to because there should be absolutely no compromise on quality so suppose there is an error in quality you can shut down the whole line and cross check you know back track and check whether all your Uh, products are as per spec or were as per spec uh, specification or not finally speed speed is improved you have an increased speed uh, from you know the very first product which is in the start of the day to the very last product at the very end of the day plus you don't need suppose if it's a new product you don't need to manufacture it and check you can simulate what the product might look like in the production line and check and you can directly send it out to mass production and 
coming to the benefits of the workers, you can improve their occupational safety through increased automation. This is a very, very high topic which is being debated. Environment, health and safety is very important. Just because a person comes to work at the factory doesn't mean you can subject him or her to unsafe working conditions. They, <coughs> excuse me. they must be able to perform their job very well and very safe. Your working conditions can be improved. Uh, more people can be trained at Industry 4.0 and everybody can you know, in their own way, collaborate on the whole process of improvement. Finally, you will also be improving the environment. You will not be polluting the environment for harmful gases, polluting the water body. And finally, your innovation will improve. So we've come to the end of the first topic. I just want to pause and uh, ask Ask Dr. Prabhakar if there are any questions we can take on Industry 4.0 before moving on to high wheel vehicles. So, do we have any questions on the Industry 4.0? Okay, so, okay, so I will directly proceed with the hybrid vehicles. Okay, great. So, hope everybody. Oh, hope everybody got a brief idea on the industry 4.0, which is one of the emerging trends. Secondly, we will come to the second one, which is hybrid vehicles. So why do I mean hybrid vehicles and not, you know, fully electric, as said in the first slide, C-A-S-E-E, electric? Well, there are a lot of disadvantages in the electric vehicle compared to your traditional petrol or diesel vehicle. First thing, the electricity which you put into your electric vehicle should be made from renewable sources of energy like wind power, tidal power or geothermal energy or through biomass. It should not be produced by just, you know, burning of coal. So if you do that, then there is no difference than driving an electric car or a hybrid or a gas or a diesel car. Second thing is the range. You cannot go the same distance as you could do in a diesel or a petrol car. Plus, the amount of charging time it takes to charge an electric vehicle leaves a lot to be desired because it will take a minimum of eight hours to charge your full battery uh, using your regular charger in your house, using the wall charger. If you use, if at all, the DC fast charging is available, it will be very fast, but it will be quite detrimental on the battery life. Plus, it's very expensive to set up a DC fast charger. So this is why I strongly advocate hybrid vehicles. Wherever you want, you can use your internal combustion vehicle and engine and whenever you want you can use your electric motor now let's move on to how exactly we can use both sources of power now this is what is called a series hybrid so what is a series hybrid you have an internal combustion engine which it takes its power from a fuel tank either petrol or diesel and this charges the battery via an alternator. And again, if, it, if you use an electric motor, which is AC, you, have, you need uh, a DC to AC converter. If you use an AC motor, you need either a step down transformer or a step up transformer, which is why there is a converter, which is called in place. So finally, the battery charges the electric motor then it goes to, to a power split device and then it directly powers the car. So to say it simply, the engine powers the battery, the battery powers the motor and the motor propels the car. It is, it's that simple. But you might say that the engine itself is polluting while you're going on to hybrid vehicles. Now most countries have moved on to Euro 6. Euro 6 is a very clean sort of uh, level 
way which reduces the impact on the environment. So this is one sort of powertrain layout which you can go for in uh, hybrid vehicles. The next layout would be a parallel hybrid, wherein you can use your engine to, to power the car or you can use the battery to power the car. It, it, it's, it's simple. The fuel tank for, gives fuel to the engine. The engine drives the rear wheels or the front wheels depending on the layout and the car goes. Or the battery powers the battery powers the electric motor and the electric motor powers the rear axle and the vehicle goes. But in this case, you will not have the engine <coughs> excuse me. You will not have the engine charging the battery or the battery helping out the engine in any sort of thing. So I just want to explain the schematic. You have a reservoir, which is a fuel tank, goes to the engine, and the generator, the charger, the converter, the electric motor, and then the differential. The converter and the electric motor are solely for the battery. So why is there a charger put in place? Most parallel hybrid vehicles are also plug-in hybrid vehicles. But then your electric only range will be very, very low as in only 20 or 30 kilometers or it is uh, around 15 miles. So this is one sort of setup. Now, another thing is a combined layout. The series parallel hybrid vehicle which is also called a combined layout. So in this case, when you want the engine to power the car, it will power the car. When you want the battery alone to power the electric motor to power the car, it will do so. But in cases where you are in stop start traffic, the engine will shut off and only the battery will power the electric motor and you can go on the highway. The engine alone will power the car and when you are in the cruising condition that is around at 40 to 50 kmph or 20 to 30 miles when you are cruising in slow speeds when you are cruising your engine will power the battery it will give it will charge the battery and the motor will provide the torque. Or in very rare cases, you will have both the engine and the motor powering the car at the same time. So hope this is clear. Now we'll move on to the applications. Now, where can we give this sort of hybrid technology to? You have a hybrid car. This is a very well-known Toyota Prius. You have a hybrid bus, which is a plug-in hybrid, which is why you can see which is why you can see the uh, pantograph on the charging station. A pantograph is the same thing which you can see on electric trains, wherein they have a handle which, which comes out from the roof, touches the overhead electric wires, and then that gives the necessary power for the train to move. So the same thing they have done for a bus. Next, you have a hybrid truck. Now, this is a specific, a very special truck because it is, it doesn't use a traditional lithium ion battery, but it uses a hydrogen fuel cell. So hydrogen fuel cells are very, very complex technologies. Uh, and this is jointly developed by Hino and Toyota. Again, this is a hybrid because it uses a internal combustion engine as well as a fuel cell to power the truck. Now we come to the hybrid two-wheeler. Oh, why does this exist? Because there is no such hybrid two-wheeler in existence. It is merely a concept. So I have come up with this, we, our team has come up with a small idea to, you know, uh, standardize this and commercialize this. So I will show you the layout of the bike which we have chosen. Before that, I'll tell you what exactly is a hybrid two-wheeler. So you have a traditional internal combustion engine motorcycle and you have an electric motorcycle. Here you can see that 
the black position here behind the front wheel is not an engine is an electric motor and if you take to your image on the left you have your internal combustion engine and that is connected to the rear wheel and that powers the bike so what are the salient features of this the petrol motorcycle has long range it has very quick refueling time it takes a maximum of 10 minutes to refuel your bike and before euro 6 has come into the picture everything from euro 1 2 3 4 pollute the environment to an extent why to an extent because just because of the sheer number of motorcycles on the road they pollute which is why euro 6 is non polluting again the electric motorcycle is near zero emission because again as i told you the the location where you're putting the charge from is very important it now bikes have existed for a long time you are near to half a century so they are durable and they are reliable electric motorcycles not as such so the reliability and durability is to be proved so let's see what concoction we can contraption we can make from this uh, from these two so this is what i propose a series hybrid which is uh, a single cylinder diesel engine euro 6 capable but not fueled by diesel fueled by biodiesel you have the diesel engine primary drive primary drive is connected to an alternator alternator converts rotatory motion to electrical uh, electrical energy the alternator powers the battery the battery through its various converters and uh, other components powers the hub motor in the on the rear wheel the gray area gray circle you see is the rear uh, hub motor so this is how the transfer of power goes engine alternator battery motor so you might ask what is say the estimated range so i've taken three considerations and i show you the range for each so the first the only thing we've varied is the motor power so first variant you take the smallest diesel biodiesel engine possible euro 6 which is 8 hp we have taken a standard battery capacity a small battery capacity since it is a two-wheeler you cannot have a heavy battery pack so it's a four kilowatt hour battery pack plus based on our calculations of gradient aerodynamic drag and speed we've arrived at the motor power of 6.7 hp Usually you will get it in kilowatt, but due to ease of understanding, I have converted it into HP 6.7. Those who want to know, one HP, uh, sorry, one kilowatt is 1.34 HP. So you can do the conversions. So, how much time does it take to charge your battery? It takes around 40 minutes to charge your small battery pack from the engine. And the amount of fuel required for one charge, one full charge of the battery is around 0.42 liters. Now, how much can you travel on this one charge? You can travel around 31 kilometers. That is only on electric power. Now, the number of times the battery can be charged on one tank of fuel. A standard tank of fuel is around 8 liters of diesel, biodiesel. So 31 times you could charge, recharge your battery on one tank of fuel. So it comes to a very simulated, uh, estimated range of 980 kilometers. So based on your convenience and uh, motor selection, you can have a smaller horsepower motor or a larger horsepower motor. And accordingly, your range will increase and decrease. But owing to a lot of environment conditions like uh, heat, cold, rain, your battery will also deteriorate and refuse to give you the full charge. Also, the battery chemistry is very important. You can have either a lithium ion battery, which is the best battery for, say, these applications, the same battery you have on your mobile phones. 
but it's very dangerous if not uh, battery pack is not built properly and it cannot be serviced suppose one cell is faulty you will not know which cell is faulty unless you have again a complex battery management system so lithium ion batteries are okay but then lead acid batteries are far safer but then you cannot say that uh, lead acid is the only way lithium ion chemistry is also improving so how would you use such a motorcycle first you refill your refuel your uh, biodiesel tank the engine charges the battery via the alternator the battery powers the motor the motor moves the motorcycle the engine recharges the battery the battery again powers the motor motor moves the motorcycle and this happens 31 times until your fuel tank runs out finally you refuel your diesel biodiesel tank and the same cycle goes on it's a very easy very easy sort of a cycle so this is sort of one idea wherein you can use for a hybrid two wheeler moving forward how do you deploy this same idea to various other applications you might say that this uh, motorcycle will, will be too heavy or uh, it will not be easy to maneuver so what do you do in that case so this is the way forward so this is a rough mock up of a new application which is a three wheeler a hybrid three wheeler you have as always your internal combustion engine biodiesel euro 6 this charges your battery pack this battery pack gives the energy to the motor the motor is controlled by the motor controller and then finally the motor turns the rear axle so this contraption moves forward so this is a very versatile application and it can be used for a wide range of uses like a load carrier or a people carrier and so on and so forth so there is one thing which is very prompt and all and uh, you know seen in all EVs which is called range anxiety i mean you will not know how far your car or bike can go with the amount of battery charge remaining so therefore uh, this range anxiety is completely eliminated because of this because wherever you run out of fuel you go to go into a fuel station and fill it with diesel and especially this engine can run on standard diesel to b5 which is 95 percentage of diesel and 5 percentage of bio diesel so the range anxiety is completely eliminated plus you don't have to sit idle during charging if it's an electric only vehicle you will have to sit idle for 8 hours the commercial uh, vehicle will be sitting idle and the worst thing for a commercial vehicle is to be sitting idle undergoing repairs or you know charging so which is why since you're your onboard charger which is your engine charges your battery there is no problem there is no idle time during charging plus you have a higher range than a standard stand alone electric vehicle so this has been you know two emerging trends of uh, the various automobile uh, technologies So thank you very much everybody for your time it has been a great honor for me to present in front of you we can have the question answer session now this for meeting trends uh, for viability development programs and others uh, it's really nice and uh, the uh, idea was clear the presentation was nice and the powerpoint is attractive sir yeah? thank you very much uh, saying that let me give a chance for dr prabhaka to say uh, uh, So I don't know what I'm saying, uh, Doctor Pramana. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I know uh, Mr. Nishan for more than three years. I know him. Okay, he's a he's a very he's a one of the best presenter ever. You can see from his uh, presentation itself, each and everything is very very clear and the clarity is very. Nishan, 
is in everything and i thank uh, mr lemi sir manual also because without him we can't conduct this event okay without the support this event is impossible so i thank uh, lemi manual yes yes thank you sir i will explain so the current thing is industry 3 wherein you have limited internet connectivity limited computer interaction you have digital manufacturing you do not have say completely autonomous robots in industry 4 you will have completely autonomous robots which can perform the task by themselves when you take welding for example the robot will know what product has come to its station the product will know where it has to weld what it has to weld how it has to weld the level of accuracy and it can also sense you know, suppose you must have say a thickness about of around 3 mm the weld thickness should be around 3 mm it will know whether it has gone up to say two decimal places like say 3.02 or 3.01 that level of accuracy and tolerance will be there for this plus you will not have say a smart factory in industry 3 only in industry 4 when all your machines are connected through iot and ai through the internet you will know whether there is an issue in something or uh, some process in industry 3 your machine will know i have to do welding i have to do welding here it will not know whether the welding is correct or not that is probably the simplest way of saying uh is that fine or you want me to explain further yes 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 correct correct okay okay so you would have seen a central lathe machine have you seen a lathe machine or say a drilling machine a standard drilling machine uh, you know the manual you know a person has to stand and operate the machine by himself everything has to be done you know uh, by the operator so the operator keeps the workpiece in the drilling machine and then the operator can see how much has to he has to drill a hole in the machine in the in the workpiece how deep the hole has to be how big the hole has to be on which surface you have to put the hole so if this is fine the operator can work on one workpiece at one time this is fine absolutely no problem but then when you have tens of thousands if you have to make 100 pieces a day one operator with one machine cannot do 100 pieces a day which is why you have a cnc machine a cnc machine works with program you have a certain set of preset codes where an operator feeds into the machine it will tell what you uh, the operator will say where the operation has to be performed how deep has to be the operation on which surface has the operation to be all that just needs to be input you will have a small display panel on the machine with numbers and a keypad you just you just have to you know input suppose you want to say a3 you just type a3 on one surface you will have say the uh, operation performed so this takes suppose when the on the manual machine he took 15 minutes for one operation the cnc machine will take around 5 minutes for one operation that is for one complete operation the operator only has to take the workpiece load into the machine and take it out after it is over that's all the machine does the job of the operator but then 
you cannot have uh, you cannot have no operator you need somebody to load the workpiece onto the machine and take it out thank you thank you very much yes Uh, well, personally, I like, uh, you know, uh, the, on the propulsion basis, on what engine will power your car, it would be, I feel, a hydrogen fuel cell. You would have seen huge airships, hydrogen airships. Now they are using helium, you know, like a blimp. So that is hydrogen. Hydrogen is the lightest gas and you can use, uh, you know, a hydrogen fuel cell, which is essentially a battery. But it uses hydrogen as a power source. So this hydrogen fuel cell is uh, does literally nothing to the environment. The only emission is water. Like now for a diesel or a petrol engine, you have a lot of emission like carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, nitrogen oxide and hydrocarbons. Wherein a hydrogen fuel cell, the only emission will be water. So on the propulsion basis, I feel that would be one uh, key area of research. And of course, you can have your own spin of autonomous vehicles for this. You can have an autonomous taxi powered by hydrogen fuel cells. You could have uh, connected cars. You can also have, you know, shared mobility. The first slide where I said CASE, connected, autonomous, shared and electric. These are the key four uh, you know, areas of research in the future. Yeah, I'm honored. We could have, we could collaborate on this. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Yes, still. Yeah. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah it's one second. I will present again. Yes, so now your parallel hybrid is there. Uh, it is simple. A parallel hybrid, your either engine can power the car or the battery can power the car. That's all. Your engine cannot power the battery. The battery cannot help in powering the engine. It is simple. You can either, the engine can power the car or the battery can power the car. In a series parallel hybrid, there are three modes of operation. One, the engine powers the car alone. Two, the battery powers the car alone. Three, the engine helps the battery in powering the motor which moves the car. There is a lot more flexibility in a series parallel hybrid. But in controlling what powers the car, either the engine or the motor, is a very complex uh, controller issue. You would need, say, a uh, main electronic control unit to decide, you know, at what speed you're traveling at to, you know, decide whether the engine has to power the car or the motor has to power the car or whether the battery level is too low so that the engine charges the battery. It's, it's more complex in a series parallel combined layout. Apart from this, you also have, you know, a regenerative braking, which is why here they have seen, uh, they have said a flywheel or a capacitor. Regenerative braking, you can use in any sort of layout. Now, what that does is it converts your braking, force, braking energy, frictional energy 
into electricity that's all so that might help out in charging the battery a little bit not fully little bit but that should not be confused with the mode of operation mode of operation in a parallel hybrid is either the engine or the motor not together in the combined it is together that's all hope i have answered your question Thank you, sir. It was my honor. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Definitely. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for the invitation.